Yeah, but he was a big deal. I mean, not just Germany and Italy, but Burgundy, too. I know. Okay. December 21st, 1940. Looking back from a 2019 perspective, it is a word, a name, that conjures up images of dead soldiers and civilians in the millions. But here in 1940, it is simply a name that this week gets a formal new meaning. Barbarossa. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Greek counteroffensive against the Italians began grinding to a halt. But the big news was the explosive British offensive against the Italians in North Africa that pushed them nearly out of Egypt entirely and took tens of thousands of prisoners in just days. Adolf Hitler also issued two directives to determine the German course of the war. And this week on the 18th, he issues another one, Führer Directive 21, to his senior commanders, which begins... The German armed forces must be prepared, even before the conclusion of the war against England, to crush Soviet Russia in a rapid campaign. Preparations are to be complete by May 15, 1941, and they are to expect both the Finns and the Romanians to fight alongside the Germans. They must take all care, though, that their intentions are not revealed. There are pages of detailed description of what the Army, Navy, and Air Force are to do, the lines of attack, and of course the objectives. First Leningrad, then Kiev, then Moscow. The final objective is to build a barrier against the Asiatic USSR on the Volga Archangel Line. Two army groups will attack north of the Pripyat Marshes and one to the south. Franz Halder, the chief of staff of the army, wants to move on Moscow quickly as the main goal. But Hitler orders a redraft that has Army Group Center lend armor and other mobile units to Army Group North for its actions versus the Baltics. Only after the fulfillment of this first essential task, which must include the occupation of Leningrad and Kronstadt, will the attack be continued with the intention of occupying Moscow. One of the initial plans that this is based on was known as Fritz, but the operation will now go by the name Barbarossa. Frederick Barbarossa, Redbeard, was Frederick I, Holy Roman Emperor from 1155 until he died. He was one of the great medieval Holy Roman Emperors, and certainly one of the most charismatic, but he drowned in 1190 in Anatolia while leading his armies to the Middle East in the Third Crusade. The legend goes that he lays sleeping in a Thuringian mountain ready to come to Germany's aid in its hour of need, which presumably is now or next year. Armament production will now focus on the army's needs. Grand Admiral Erich Rader is horrified by this since he thinks Germany should really secure the Mediterranean before doing anything else. Rader is a strong opponent of the whole Soviet adventure. And he does have influence with Hitler. He was the one who'd advocated the attack on Norway last spring. He had been part of talking Hitler into making plans to invade Britain and then, importantly, talking him out of it once it became obvious it wouldn't work. He is really worried about Germany ending up in another two-front war. He had advocated Operation Felix, the plan to take Gibraltar, though that's now off the table. He, and to a lesser extent Hermann Goering, though Goering is by now cooperating with Barbarossa preparations, are interested in the Balkans and in Turkey to really squeeze Britain from that end of the Mediterranean. He's also interested in taking French North Africa to support Italy there, or taking the Atlantic islands of the Canaries and Azores. But as John Keegan writes, while Hitler was excited by the prospect of bringing the Atlantic islands under German control, he continued to set his face inflexibly against the idea of adding the United States to his list of enemies. In the autumn of 1940, even as he withdrew from the thought of risking 36 of the Wehrmacht's best divisions on the turbulent tides of the Channel, he clung as if by the force of dogma to the principle of placating Britain's natural co-belligerent in the face of almost any provocation she might offer. Russia he would brave in its lion's den. The United States he would not confront at all. But here's the thing. Keegan goes on to explain that Hitler's reasoning for this is not any fear of American military power or any admiration for that nation. And 
He does not believe that America's superior commercial and production capacity can play any part in Germany's war outlook for years. It was precisely because his attitude to America was devoid of ideological content that he chose to disregard all provocations she might offer him in the months Barbarossa was in the making. The maintenance of diplomatic, if not friendly, relations with the United States was a necessary simplification of the strategic balance sheet that would allow the preordained struggle with the Soviet Union to be brought and carried through with the least possible diversion of effort. And they've been successful so far. Germany and the German people had rejoiced in the rather spectacular victories of the first half of this year. The German people in general had a lot of skepticism about the war when it began, but that's pretty much gone by now. Hitler holds another speech in the Berlin Sportspalast the 18th. And I read in Max Hastings, all hell let loose the reaction of a young pilot in attendance. I do not suppose the world has ever known a more brilliant orator than this man. His magnetic personality is irresistible. One can sense the emanations of willpower and driving energy. We listen to the spellbinding words and accept them with all our hearts. We have never before experienced such a deep sense of patriotic devotion towards our German fatherland. But Hitler is no longer the only one winning spectacular victories. The British counteroffensive against the Italians in North Africa continues this week. The 7th and 4th Armored Brigades keep up their advance and pursuit, along with the 16th Infantry Brigade that was detached from the 4th Indian Division last week. On the 15th, the British take Halfaya Pass on the Libyan border and now have a route into central Cyrenaica. The next day, the 4th Brigade captures City Omar and the Italians withdraw from Solom and Fort Capuzzo. The British reach the Libyan border in force the 17th as the Italians have retreated to their stronghold of Bardia further up the coast. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill wires the army. Your first objective now must be to maul the Italian army and rip them off the African shore to the utmost extent. On the 19th, the Italians appeal to Hitler to send a German armored division to North Africa as soon as possible, for they do not currently have a solution for the British Matilda tanks. The advance has stopped by the end of the week though. Supply lines have been thinly stretched and the British 7th Armoured waits for the full arrival of the 6th Australian Division before continuing battle. Britain might be getting more than just Australian help soon though. On the 17th, American President Franklin Roosevelt holds a press conference outlining the plan he wants to introduce to send aid to Britain called Lend-Lease. His argument is that if a neighbor's house is on fire, it's only sensible to lend him a hose to stop the fire spreading to your own house. And it would be stupid to think of asking for payment in such circumstances. Any new military supplies, especially gotten without forking over ready cash, would of course be great for Britain, who is not only fighting in North Africa, but also in East Africa. See, ever since the loss of British Somaliland to Italy in the summer, the British have been considering and planning a counteroffensive. The time for that is not yet here, though the planning is fairly nearly complete. But there have been small attacks and skirmishes like we saw early last month. Well, this week on the 16th, the South African forces mount their first major military action of the war. This is the first South African infantry brigade supported by tankettes which here are specially adapted Bren gun carriers, the Gold Coast Light Gun Battery, and Pioneers from Kenya. The attack is on El Wak and is over by midday. It is a big success, and other than just defeating the Italians. The attackers take a lot of supplies, like cars, trucks, machine guns, and rifles, but it really highlights the kind of problems a counteroffensive here will face. There are the long distances and the tough terrain. I mean, this is a fairly local attack, but it's still nearly 180 kilometers from home base. There is only one crappy road to even travel on. The last 60 kilometers had to be crossed at night to preserve surprise, the last 10 on foot. The attack is made in a shade temperature of 40 degrees Celsius, that's 105 Fahrenheit. The 1,200 vehicles used bring food and water for five days one gallon per person per day. So that's five gallons total or nearly 19 liters of water per person they have to carry. 
Also, the attackers are sitting ducks should enemy air attack happen to come. So it is really clear that future attacks will have a hell of a lot of problems, logistical and otherwise, to overcome. And with those deep thoughts, I will end the week. A week of British successes on two African fronts and Hitler's Barbarossa directive, a harbinger of a great expansion of this world war. And boy, is it an ambitious plan. Succeeding in reaching the Volga Archangel line would more than double the size of Germany and the German occupied lands. You know, I imagine for some of you, it gets monotonous to speak of thousands or millions of dead soldiers or civilians as the result of some action in this war or back in the Great War. But I think it's necessary because this is not cool. World War II isn't cool. It's interesting, and I think it's necessary for us to learn from, but it ain't cool. However Barbarossa plays out, whoever wins in however much or little time, a full-on fight between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union is going to have a death toll in the millions. There is nothing at all cool about that. If you would like to learn more about something else that there is nothing at all cool about, and that unfortunately resulted in millions of people dying, check out our 1932 Between Two Wars video on the Holodomor genocide in the Soviet Union right here soon. Our Patreon supporter of the week is John Dixon. And thanks to patrons like John, our war effort is running well-oiled and smoothly so far. So come on now, folks, do your part. Become a part of the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. The global war effort needs you. Subscribe, click the bell. See you next time.